awesome. Let us just continue to believe that the Lord loves us and He cares for us. Thank God for His communion. Thank the Lord for what He has brought to mankind in Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to get right into the Word uh, today. <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about the righteousness of faith. Now, uh, remember, we've got three, three, uh, three righteousnesses we're going to discuss, and we're going to try and do this over three Sundays. Um, the first one is the righteousness of faith. What is the righteousness of faith? <clears throat> If we don't understand the different righteousnesses that the Bible talks about, or the way in which the writers of the Bible approach righteousness, uh, we, will, uh, we will really get confused, and we will find that people argue with each other, we will find different kinds of doctrines coming forth, anything from universalism to uh, uh, overemphasis on faith, um, to a works righteous uh, uh, look at faith and finances and those kind of things uh, it, and it will just not produce life so <clears throat> when we when we define righteousness I think it's very important to see what righteousness really is you know, the Bible talks about the righteousness of God then it talks about uh, uh, the, the, the righteous that believes or the righteousness that is imputed and then the Bible talks about the righteousness of the law so it's clear that there is different ways in which we can look at this as different approaches. And if I come to you and I say to you that every man is righteous, um, but I am talking about the righteousness of faith or the righteousness of God, uh, you know, then I will have some people disagree with me. Or if I say to you that righteousness is imputed unto you when you believe, and you look at the righteousness, uh, you know, of the law, for instance, you will say, but what did Jesus Christ then come to do? You know, isn't everybody righteous? And there will be great confusion. And I find that in gray circles that that is a problem. So I just feel, as, um, <clears throat> as the pastor of Dynamic Love Web Fellowship, I want the people in this fellowship to have stability, uh, not to fall around with every wind of doctrine, and just to have this this understanding of what this is all about. Now, if we go and look at Peter, um, let us go there. If we go and look at Peter, and we're going to read in 1 Peter 1, it says here, <clears throat> Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him, that has called us through glory and virtue, according to the divine power um, has g given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge or the acknowledgement of Him that has called us through um, call us to glory and virtue. Let's read uh, chapter 1 there. I, th I want to read another verse here. I've, I've, I didn't co copy enough of them. Let me just go there quickly. Um, And this, this is what I, I don't know why I didn't copy this, but here it is in verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. Let's read verse 3 again. According as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the acknowledgement of Him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Through Jesus Christ has been given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, that by the precious promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in this world, which is through lust, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your, virtue, to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge, and goes on. I'm not going to explain those verses today. Um, but what we can see here, and this is what is important for me, is that when we look at these verses, it says that there, there's a divine nature that we can be made partakers of. Now, this divine nature was revealed in Jesus by His resurrection. Um, and that is the divine nature as, as pertaining to the nature of God in the sense of having the attributes of God's 
personality or uh, his, his character traits and how he lives but also the divine nature as in the nature Jesus possess in a glorified human body. Now, there has been, we will be made partakers of those things through precious promises. So God promised us that the divine nature will come forth in us by the power of resurrection or by the power of the Holy Spirit. So please remember that. This is very important to understand um, as pertaining to the righteousness of faith. You might say, Beth, you have not even spoken about or, or read a verse about righteousness in that passage, but you're talking about the righteousness of faith. We must realize that the righteousness of faith has got everything to do with a promise. It's got everything to do with the promise and we need to understand that. So here it comes and it says that we will be partakers of the divine nature. How? By what God promised. So by reading that, we can come to the bottom line conclusion that God made the manifestation of the divine nature in you His responsibility and not yours. Now think about that. Again, God comes and He says, through precious promises that there is in Christ, shall we be partakers of the divine nature. Now think of that. So God gives promises and through the promise, through what He promised us, the divine nature will manifest in us. So again, the bottom line conclusion, God made fruit and salvation. In your life, His responsibility and not yours. Glory to God. Now you might say, Bhakti, I, I'm not so sure about that. Let's just read more. Uh, here we go in a verse, a chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to the abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now those might sound like difficult words, but let's just read it again. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy, listen to this, has begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of the dead. Now let me explain this, um, this birth that he's talking about there. When Adam sinned, everybody was begotten unto the expectation of decay and death. That's what God said to Adam. He said, if you eat of this tree, the only hope you'll have, I'm, I'm just using my own words, is death. The only thing you can expect is death from this tree. So if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what will happen to you? You will surely die. Of this death you will die. So what can Adam, according to God, expect when he eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? He will die. He can only expect death and everything that is around and packaged with death. So when Adam came and as the man in the Godhead, you know, that had the life of God with him, that was fellowshipping with God, made the image and likeness of God, came and he ate of this tree, everybody was begotten unto the expectation of death. No one could expect, you know, life because they were all under that system. It's like being under the... Um, uh, uh, and let me put it this way, as long as what they under that system, the only fruit they could bear was fruit unto death, according to Romans chapter 7. So, Adam has begotten man unto not a living hope, unto death, that they can only expect death. That was the hope man could have. But then Christ came, and when 
excuse me, when Jesus came and He died for mankind and He died away mankind's death, He died away the old Adam and He was raised from the dead. When He was raised from the dead, when what we see in Him is what we can now expect by the very same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Okay, now let me explain that. When Jesus died, He died, we died with Him. When He rose again, you know, what, what can we expect if we died with Him? What does the Bible say in Romans 6? That we will be in the likeness of His resurrection. Now, what is the hope that we can have? Listen to this verse again. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, who according to His abundant mercy, has begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. So, what is the thing that we can expect? We can expect it to be in the likeness of His resurrection. Now, we know that we've been raised with Him in the sense that, you know, we are raised up from the death that we see the first fruit of the Spirit in our life. But there is still an outstanding um, hope. There's still something we expect from the resurrection. Because what did Jesus die? He died as an, a, a man whose body came from um, Mary, just a normal flesh guy. He died. Then when, which, which is us? And then when he was raised, what body was he raised with? An immortal, undying, glorified human body with which he sat at the right hand of the Father. So what is the expectation that we can have from the resurrection? That we'll be raised from the dead. That is the hope. That is the Christian hope. The Christian hope is the resurrection from the dead. And this is a key part of it by the Holy Spirit. So, the Spirit of God came, it, He indwelled Jesus, or Jesus had the Spirit inside Him. That Spirit, even if Jesus died, could raise Jesus from the dead to sit at the right hand of the Father. Now, should we receive the very same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, what will the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit will bring forth the divine nature in us and the Holy Spirit will raise us from the dead. So what is our hope? What is our expectation of the gospel? Is that God will fulfill His responsibility which is when we receive the Holy Spirit that we will find that Spirit bring forth the divine nature in us and and make us immortal in the return of Jesus Christ. In other words, give us the resurrection from the dead. So, what do we expect from the Holy Spirit? To take the victory that Christ gave and manifest victory over sin and victory over death in us as we yield our members as instruments unto this righteousness of God. Now you might say, Betty, but what does that have to do with the with the, the righteousness of faith. Now, let, j just give me a moment. I need to explain these things. and Let me just recap. I want you to follow me in this. Number one, God made a promise. The promise is, not just in words, we got promised with words. The promise is what Jesus was raised up into. Okay, that's what God promises us. When we hear the Holy Spirit speak to us and we receive the Spirit. And I'm going to explain to you how you receive the Spirit because everybody has not received the Holy Spirit. Um, people might say, but the Holy Spirit speaks to everybody. The Holy Spirit speaks in your heart. It doesn't matter if the Spirit of God even indwells you. Um, you know, it doesn't mean, even if the Spirit would speak in your heart and in your mind, doesn't mean that you have received that Spirit or that you walk by that Spirit. And, and that I will explain. I don't want to exclude anybody here, but I don't want to exclude us from being the God kind, according to Acts 17. I don't want to exclude us from being a person that lives by the persuasion of our heart as God does. So we don't want to exclude anything here. We want the original plan manifested. Okay, so <clears throat> back to the point again. Number one, God made a promise. 
This promise is the following. The Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, if that Spirit's in you, you can expect ex exactly what Jesus Christ has, has uh, ha or what Jesus Christ had. Let me put it even more simple. When Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, that is the promise God gave every man. I promise you this. How, did Jesus, how was Jesus raised from the dead? By the glory of the Father. Or, in other, other words, the Holy Spirit. The Bible says Jesus was raised by the Spirit of God. The Father raised Him by His Spirit, by the Holy Spirit He was raised. So what happens now uh, when we see people believe the truth? They receive the Spirit. Now let me explain how you receive the Spirit. I explained this, this, this way this morning. When I, if I don't like cycling, and I want to start to like cycling, then the only thing I've got to do is go to the cycling shop or get some friends that love cycling and just be in their presence for a month or two and just go to the cycling shop a bit and you'll see the beautiful bicycles and it will start to speak to you and then you will find that as in South Africa, South Africa is really, you know, people cycle a lot in South Africa. It's like, let, let's not, don't think I'm too spiritual, but it's like a spirit of cycling in South Africa. You know, the spirit is already in South Africa, and if you are in, in South Africa, man, you're in the place where there's a spirit of cycling. But I don't find everybody walking by the spirit of cycling. You know, I mean, I was on the way to church today, and I think that there was a race, there must have been about a thousand people on the road today, a thousand cyclists on the road today. I was on my way to church. They were enjoying the cycling. You know, so um, I'm not saying cycling is wrong, but please just understand what I'm trying to say. The one person's life is governed by that spirit of cycling. You know, and that spirit of cycling raises him up to be a cyclist. And in the very same way with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God has been poured out, the Bible says, on all flesh. It's been poured out on the planet. We are now in a place where the Kingdom of God has now come. And the Spirit of our Lord is now here, speaking to the heart of every person. But as we hang out in that atmosphere and listen to the Holy Spirit, we'll come to a place where we can then believe this truth and walk according to the Spirit of Truth and receive that Spirit into us. And as the Spirit of Cycling would give life to a cyclist in a person that allows that Spirit in him. Now I find people completely overweight. You know, like, you know cycling. You know, they, you, you can, it's uncomfortable for them or whatever, but it doesn't matter. The, 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 that spirit of cycling will bring forth a cyclist in them. You know, in the very same way, once the spirit of God has entered into us, which is the spirit of our innocence, which is the spirit of our forgiveness, which is the spirit of Christ, which is the union that there is between the Father and the Son, that, that oneness in the Trinity, once we start to say, well, the Spirit that God walks by is this. The, the, the Spirit or the basic principle or the life principle by which God walks is this. If one man died for all and that man was raised up, that means that the same is available for every man. And that is God's promise to you. Immortality and victory over sin in the flesh. By the resurrection power of Christ. That's what He promises you. Now you might say, but what does that have to do with righteousness by faith? Now let's go to Romans chapter 4. People see, without understanding this, Romans 4 means absolutely nothing. It means nothing. And we will look at Romans 4 from the traditional word of faith perspective. And we will say, uh, Abraham didn't grow faint at the promises of God. And he believed God. And, you know, and then we will use that towards our car and our money and our house and all those kind of things. You know, years ago when I was still in the Dutch Reformed Church, I, I believed that, you know, God will take us to heaven. That's the promise. Then I got into the charismatic church and then I believe God promised me a Rolex and a jet. That's what He promises me. And then I used all the scriptures and I didn't go Grow, didn't want to grow weary at the promise, which is a Rolex, a house, prosperity, and all the worldly things, just by the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, <clears throat> please hear, I'm not saying that God cannot provide for you in this world. Last night in Web Church, we spoke, or in, in our Web, Web Pastors Fellowship, we spoke about this. You know, provision is a given. It's like, you don't worry about oxygen. It's a given. 
in the same way you know you don't try and trust for oxygen it is available in the very same way God cares for the just and the unjust you the righteous the unrighteous everybody the believer unbeliever he provides food for everybody he provides for all people there are, there are some people that are rich in this world you know and and they're not believers but now as Christians we want to follow some principles somehow to persuade God where he said in Matthew 6 don't you know you've got a heavenly father and that he knows you've got need of these things if he cares for the birds, how much more shall he not care for you? These things will be added anyway. Rather, look for things that you don't understand now. Things like the kingdom of God, that you can understand what righteousness, peace and joy is by the Holy Spirit, or which is the spirit of our holiness, which is the atmosphere that says we have been made holy or set apart by the work of Christ. Amen. Um, now, for those of you that listen, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit is not a person. I just think that we have, we have not understood the concept of the spirit of innocence. Right, but let's go on. And we read uh, Romans 4 here about Abraham. Uh, here it is. Romans 4.1 What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? In other words, what he says is here, what he actually is saying is, shall we say that Abraham uh, was who he was because of circumcision? That according to the flesh has found, uh, you know, it talks about circumcision. Do you say that he has found the blessedness of God because he was circumcised or obeyed laws? Then it says, <clears throat> for if Abraham were justified by works, he has therefore um, something to glory about but not before God for what does the scripture say Abraham believed God and it the fact that he believed God was counted unto him for righteousness now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt but to him that works not but believes on him that justifies the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness now let us just go to Romans 4 here as well then I want to read another verse here verse 19 and this talks about Abraham and being not weak in the faith he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb you see here he doesn't consider the death in his body he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief he did not stagger at God's promise through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what God or He, that's now God, had promised, He was able to perform, and therefore it was imputed to Him for righteousness. So what is He saying here? God made a promise to Abraham. And when Abraham could believe that this, that God, could justify the ungodly when Abraham could believe that even if I haven't done many things right I didn't obey the law for God to come to me and say to me move to another land and, and move to a land that I will show you get yourself to a place I want to bless you I want to be good to you what, what did Abraham do for God to do that nothing when God said to Abraham, move, when God said to Abraham, I promise you that your descendants will be, you know, as the stars of heaven and the sand of the sea and all those kind of things, they will be many. When God promised him that, this is what Abraham did. He believed that God could bring forth the fruit in him and he didn't stagger in unbelief thinking God cannot bring forth the fruit in him. You know? And we've got a lot to say about Hagar and, and that, you know, we need to understand, and, and this is also my book on finances that will be available um, before I even go to the United States, I'm sure it will be available. <clears throat> Hagar, it was like a Babylonian custom that if you could not have children after 10 years that your wife could give you your, you know, her, uh, uh, the, the slave girl that could, you know, or the, the lady that helped you in the house, and you could have a child with her. It was the, it was the law of that time. That was, and they thought, well, maybe this is the way um, that things that, that that things should happen. You know, 
Uh, in the very same way, you know, we today, we can live with an expectation. And, and, and when we, so, so please let's not judge Abraham, uh, you know, concerning Hagar and those kind of things. You know, he, God said, I will give you from Sarah. And he didn't, he thought, I think he was confused because we must remember, Abraham wasn't born in the Bible Belt. Abraham wasn't born in the theological capital of South Africa, Stellenbosch or, or uh, uh, Potchefstroom. Room. You know, he wasn't born there. He was like this guy that had idols and everything, and then God came and blessed the ungodly. That's it. And then from there, and then he just believed that if God said this, that's okay, then God will bring it forth. So in the very same way with us, <clears throat> Paul comes and he uses this this incident with Abraham, when Abraham believed God and was accounting for righteousness, to set something straight in the church in Rome and to set something straight in the Jewish mind. Imagine, or, or, let me put it this way, the Jews that time thought that if you believe in faith righteousness, it's a sin. It's absolute sin. How can you just believe that God will take an ungodly person and justify him with the promise which is eternal life and fruit in his life? How, how, how do you want to, based on what? Do you say God is just going to do that and we must neglect the law of Moses, don't follow the customs of Moses and all those things? Imagine a nation whose father... Then God appeared to Moses in the finger of God, wrote down a law, gave it to Moses. Moses came down. God appeared to the people. God appeared to Moses. The earth, the, the, the Red Sea parted. The, so many miracles happened and you know for sure that the law is right. The law was given. And here we are the Jewish nation now with the only set of laws that can actually satisfy God so that we can be right, counted righteous before Him or seen as the people that can have eternal life or immortality and all the blessedness of God. I mean, and then you come and tell those people, ah, oh, you know, this law thing, just forget about it, you know. God said that he, he makes available eternal life to every person now. You must just believe that when Jesus was raised from the dead, you know, that that resurrection there is the hope for every man. Uh, what do you think are they going to say? They're going to say, uh, uh, son, didn't your mom say you're not supposed to smoke that stuff? That's what you're going to tell him. Are you crazy? You're a heretic. We're going to stone you. That's the kind of thing. And they were thinking that living by faith, just that God will bless a sinner, is a sin. And here Paul comes and he says, Shall we say that Abraham have attained unto the righteousness of the law? Or unto, that he has attained unto the blessing? In other words, that he received what God promised him because he obeyed laws? No. How was Abraham reckoned righteous while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Uncircumcised. What did he do? He just believed God. What did he believe? He believed that God made it his responsibility to bring forth fruit in your life according to what God has promised and that was accounted to him for righteousness. It doesn't mean he was unrighteous as pertains to the death of Christ. It just means that that is an equitable deed of righteousness. What is obedience towards God? What is a, a righteous towards God when God appears to you and tells you, I've taken away all your sin. A man was raised from, uh, uh, raised from, from, the, from the dead. And I promise you that that life um, I, I promise to you. What will, what will you say is a righteous action? If God has gone through all of that to make that available to you and say that to you, what is the righteous thing to do? Simple. Believe. Believe and don't try and make it work by your power or principles. Because that would be sin. If God says, I promise you eternal life by the resurrection of Christ and that's available to you, and you don't believe Him, and you try and obey uh, principles or whatever to get life to manifest in you, that is sin. Absolute sin. Unrighteous. It's not equitable. It is not in line or doesn't weigh up with the Trinity dynamics inside of the Trinity.
You are not walking by the righteousness in the Godhead that is not righteous. It is not in line. It doesn't weigh up to what is expected from you. What God expects from you is to sit back and just trust Him and believe Him that Jesus took away the sin of the whole world. To believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. That when Jesus died, you died. When He was raised, you were raised. And as that spirit of your innocence and what we call the spirit of truth enters our heart, what happens? That Spirit raises us up and brings forth the fruit in our life. In this life, we find joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, meekness, temperance, faithfulness, wisdom, love, all those kind of things we find in this life. Plus, we've got the expectation that this Spirit of Christ that is already indwelling us is the seal of our salvation unto the hope of immortality in the return of Christ. In that way, we have escaped death and corruption in this world because we're not under the system of lust anymore wherein I desire to become, but I'm in the place of God has promised it's done. Glory to God. And that is what we call the righteousness of faith or to have righteousness imputed unto you. That word imputed there means to, to make a calculation and to come to a bottom line conclusion that that was the right thing. So when we walk in the Spirit, it means our life is in this system that says, He brings forth the fruit in me. His and what is the Spirit? I say, I'm innocent, I'm forgiven, I'm a, I became a new man, the old man, the man that was justified by works. He's dead. I'm now justified by the God. By God. He justifies me. How? It's called grace. This grace here that he talks about, he says here, um, that Abraham received not by the works, you know, of the law through circumcision and those things, but by God that promised and God brought it forth. Then it goes on, if you work for it, it is of debt and not of grace. So what is grace? Grace is God's influence upon you, wherein God brings forth the fruit and God brings forth the immortal life in you. Even if you're dead 10,000 years, you will be raised. That's the power of this spirit. And He brings forth that fruit in you by Him promising it and then bringing it forth. Now when that spirit of, I am innocent, I am forgiven, I, I, I am, uh, uh, um, you know, as pertaining to the law's righteousness, I've been made righteous, my sins have been taken away, even the law's been taken away, you cannot find me guilty. When I start to walk in that, I find that the truth and the power of that spirit brings forth the first fruit, and it will bring forth the latter fruit, you know? So that is what it will bring forth. And that then is imputed to me and said, this is righteous. The calculation that God made about me and about what is done and presented to me is righteous. Do you think it would have been righteous for Abraham to say to God, no thank you, I don't want this, I don't believe you? No, that's unrighteous. If God comes to you and you've obeyed the law and you've been under the law all the time and He comes to you and He says to you, listen, I take that, took that law upon me, I fulfilled it, it's not by your power, I've set you free from bondage, I promise you that I will bring forth fruit in you and I will give you life. What is the right, what, what if, if I must make a, have a word over your life when you're presented with that and you say, oh God, please give me a break. You know, I don't need that. Do you think that's righteous? That's not accounted to you for righteousness. That will be accounted to you for sin. If you say, no, no, I'm still going to try and tithe, sow and reap, do all these principles. That's unrighteousness. That action is accounted to you, said, this is unrighteous. This is not righteous. Although all your sins are forgiven, that action right there is one of unrighteousness. So what shall we do? We shall not seek justification or, in other words, the fruit of the Spirit plus immortality by the works of the law. That is the righteousness of faith. Glory to God. 
I hope you understand righteousness of faith or righteousness that's imputed unto us. Uh, next Sunday we will talk about the righteousness of the law and we will also talk about the righteousness of God on the Sunday after that and what it actually means to be made the righteousness of God. Because to be made the righteousness of God and to have righteousness accounted unto you is not the same thing. It is not the same thing. And uh, we will talk about those things. Thank you so much that you have slotted into this webcast. I trust that you're going to be, you know, just blessed in this week as you listen to this message again. Please use the freedom to share this with somebody. Um, it would be wonderful if you can share this with somebody. Glory to God. Um, let us just pray together and then I want to just say something about finances.